Move right on and uh, introduce a gentleman who, uh, in, in the domain in which I'm active, uh, actually requires very little introduction. But, but for those of you who, who don't already know Rob, um, he'll probably tell you that he grew up on a farm, uh, which, is, which is an important grounding uh, feature, perhaps, uh, in his life. But he spent most of his career uh, trying to do what we've just been talking about, trying to make the world a better place uh, through sustainable ag and innovation. And I think, you know, just a couple of, of um, you can read his bio in, in the program here, but um, a couple of things that pulled together a comment that Edie made. Uh, Rob has not only received the World Food Prize uh, to, to um, um, recognize his tremendous work in supporting the, the physical task of feeding um, up to 10 billion people sustainably. He also received from President Clinton the National Medal of Technology, demonstrating the other side of the coin, that, that ag is indeed uh, a technology-intensive space. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Rob uh, Fraley. Appreciate it. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Taylor for that great introduction. Thank all of our uh, wonderful sponsors who are here from the uh, STEM Food and Ag Council and the uh, STEM Connector. And most importantly, uh, thank all of you who uh, have an interest in learning about the ag food chain for, uh, for your time. So um, let me uh, get started, get organized here. And uh, I want to start with a little conversation on farming. So uh, just for a second, close your eyes and, uh, and think about farming. And then uh, look on that screen and tell me whether, uh, whether any of this came across as, you know, that windmill in the background, uh, farmers uh, lined up working hard, uh, their pitchforks and their overalls. I mean, that's a mental image that, uh, that you know, a lot of us have on, uh, of farming, but a lot has changed. When my grandpa was a farmer, right in the middle of central Illinois, about half of the people who lived in the state were on the farm. Today, now, it's probably less than 2%. So this is a, is a pretty old image, and it reflects uh, an enormous amount of uh, change. So maybe if, uh, if you didn't think about farming in that way, maybe you, uh, maybe you thought about it as the, uh, the farmer. So uh, you know, a rugged guy uh, tilling the soil on, a, on an old uh, tractor, um, you know, uh, hardworking and, uh, and uh, you know, making a living uh, for he and his family. And, most likely back then, uh, you know, the farmer and his wife probably had eight or ten kids because farming was, uh, was hard work and, you know, kids had to do, uh, do a lot of chores. Um, kind of like, uh, like this cute kid. That, that was me when I was five years old. So uh, I did grow up on one of those farms and I did learn how to, uh, to drive a tractor when I was about six years old and uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to do lots of chores and pull weeds and bale hay, all the things that farm kids uh, you know, typically uh, did back then. But uh, my life changed. I was the first in the family to get to go to college. Uh, went to the University of Illinois, got my PhD degree in microbiology and biochemistry. Had a life-changing experience uh, moving to California, to San Francisco, to the University of California at San Francisco back in the late 70s. This was the time period when the whole biotechnology industry was being created. The scientists had first learned how to clone and isolate genes, and even by the time I was out there, uh, the first inklings on how this new science of biotechnology could impact healthcare was already being established. My interest was how could we use these tools to, uh, to help farmers, because one of the things I remember growing up on the farm was how hard it was how hard the work was, and how challenging and frustrating it was. I can still, today, remember my dad sitting around the kitchen table worrying about diseases and insects and, you know, the heartbreak when you're growing a crop and it just doesn't rain and, uh, and your crop gets decimated. And so I was really passionate on how we could use these tools to, uh, to improve uh, farmers. So, uh, obviously, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be here today if things didn't work out pretty well. And uh, looking back, it's been a, a phenomenal career. And in many ways, I've never left the farm because I've continued to look for how do we invent new technologies to help farmers farm better, farm easier, farm more sustainably in the future. So a small team of scientists, when I joined Monsanto, worked together to create the first methods for being able to put a new gene 
into a plant cell that would allow the plant to grow up and add new properties. And so we worked on areas of how can we make crops more resistant to drought, more resistant to insects, more resistant to, to weeds, and, and provide new tools to farmers. And uh, it's been exciting to, to see the, uh, the technology and how it's uh, helped to change farming around the world, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And so it's been a great blend of, of, of the excitement of science with the satisfaction of seeing these tools literally now become part of the, the everyday lives of over 18 million farmers around the world in 30 countries, and, and many of them here in the US and, uh, and abroad. Now, you're not gonna escape this without just a little bit of background on science. So, you know, as the guy who helped invent, uh, you know, biotechnology crops or GMOs, this is how it works. We were able to take a, a bacterium called agrobacterium that naturally introduces genes into plants, kind of like a vaccination. We were able to put our useful genes into the bacterium. That bacterium put them into the plant cells. And in the laboratory, we could turn those cells into, into shoots and plants. And, uh, and those genes became part of the, the genetics of the corn plant or the soybean plant or the cotton plant like any other gene. And as I said, the, uh, the technology now has, uh, has uh, expanded. These first experiments were done in the early 80s. By 1996, we had uh, commercialized the first crops with the GMO traits, and, uh, and now we're celebrating literally the 20th anniversary of this, uh, of this science that's really helped to change and improve agriculture. Now, I would also tell you, in spite of the excitement and the enthusiasm, you know, there's been challenges in acceptance and communication. I mean, You've probably heard of the word GMO before, and you know in some circles, uh, you know it's got both positive and negative connotations. The way I described uh, the GMO process as a scientist is, it's just a continuation and a refinement of what man has been doing from the beginning of time to improve his crops. I often use this map because, you know, on the uh, on the left hand side, you can see those are the crops that are native to the various countries in the world. And when you get to the U.S., you'll see, you know, when the, uh, you know, when, um, you know, Columbus landed here in the U.S., we were very, you know, we had strawberries and we had sunflowers and uh, and a few trees. All of the crops we associate today as being produced in this country, tomatoes came from South America, corn came from Mexico, soybeans came from China, were all genetically modified and adapted to grow in the U.S. And that genetic modification, scientists and plant breeders had a tremendous impact. I love the pictures on the right-hand side because they show you what early ancestral corn looked like and now what it looks like with all the genetic modification from plant breeders. Same thing with bananas or carrots. And so, the, we've had, you know, for 10,000 years, a, a history of our society of using science to improve crops. And in my mind, what the GMOs allow us to do is to do that even faster, more precisely, gene by gene. And so that's, uh, that's a bit of background on the, uh, the science. I think in a, in a bigger sense, you know, I mentioned I was at UCSF when the biotech industry started. You know, I wrote an article a few years ago entitled, you know, we actually live in a GMO world. Um, and, and this is where the, the audience participation comes in. So you know, we talk about GMOs in agriculture, but what do you think was the first GMO product? Any ideas? It was a medicine, and good guess. It was actually human insulin. And so all diabetics, if you have a parent or a friend or if you're personally impacted, the, the insulin we use today is produced in a laboratory very purely from yeast and bacteria, and it's pristine, it's sterile, and it's the, uh, the product that's used. And that was the first biotech product. But today in the, in the world of healthcare, about half of all of the new drugs are based on uh, GMO technology, whether it's the latest cancer cure or the latest cure for arthritis. But it doesn't stop there. I mean, you know, the second impactful GMO product was actually a food product. How many of you eat cheese? All right, be honest, come on. We all, we all love cheese on the pizza and stuff like that. Well, milk is converted to cheese by an enzyme called chymosin. And again, 
the world was running out of chymosin, so by cloning the gene for chymosin, putting it in a bacteria or yeast and producing it in the laboratory, we could produce large quantities of this enzyme to keep up with all the demand around the world. So a big part of our cheese comes from that. A couple of other examples I'd just like to, to talk about is, you know, uh, I wear blue jeans when I'm at home. You know, I always wash them in cold water and put all my clothes together. I don't know if any of you do that, if you do your own laundry. The reason you can do that is because your laundry soap now has enzymes in it that literally dissolve the fats and the stains and the dirt. Those are all GMO products. And then my f last one, are any of you uh, aquarium aficionados? You grow f have fish at home? All right, so you ever heard of glowfish? So glowfish are actually genetically engineered. They contain the uh, fluorescent protein gene from coral and algae, and that's what gives them those bright uh, blue and purple and yellow colors. So we do live in a, in a GMO world, and, uh, and that's really part of the, uh, the, uh, the excitement of how this technology has changed agriculture. But coming back to crops, uh, you know, it's been used now for 20 years. It's helped farmers to improve their yields uh, and when we say yields, we mean they're able to produce more food out of every acre of land. And an acre is about the size of a football field. And that, uh, that helps both from the point of view of making farmers more profitable. It obviously helps to produce more food. And that helps consumers both in terms of choice and food affordability. So this technology has been used for 20 years. Here in the United States, I would tell you that probably 90% of the corn, the soybean, the cotton, the sugar beet farmers use some form of this technology because it helps them uh, grow their crops uh, you know, more efficiently and, uh, and more effectively. And so the, the food security part of this is important. And I'll come back and, 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 and talk about that in more detail. But the other side of it, which is really critical, which I think you know, as an industry and as a company we haven't communicated sufficiently about is the environmental benefits of this technology. Because if you're taking that acre of land, that football field of land, and if you can double the amount of food that's produced on that piece of land, you're producing more food actually with less input, less rainfall, less water, less chemicals, less fertilizer, and that's a good thing for the environment. And so these tools have helped farmers to produce more using less inputs, specifically reducing you know, some of the crop chemical products like insecticides and some of the pesticides that, uh, that farmers use. But also, you remember that picture I showed you of the farmer on the tractor tilling the soil? Um, we've given farmers better tools so that they don't have to do as much farm labor. And that lets them, instead of tilling the soil, they can preserve the soil, keep the nutrients, keep the moisture in it. So it's had a lot of, uh, of uh, environmental benefits. In the end, if you think about it as a planet and the challenge ahead, if we can take each of the pieces of land that we farm around the world and farm them even more efficiently and effectively, that takes away the pressure to clear new land, you know, to tear down a forest, to drain a wetland, to clear a prairie. And that's also, I think, really important as we think about the legacy that we'd like to leave our kids in the, uh, in the future. So I've talked about one specific example using some of the most sophisticated advanced biology that, that's available. It's the same biology that's creating new drugs and new pharmaceuticals. And when I look on the horizon, there's brand new techniques in biology. Some of you have probably heard of gene editing or CRISPR-Cas, an even more uh, powerful and special tool that can help both human medicine and, and produce better crops. But there's also an incredible amount of science coming in from engineering and data science. In fact, I, I would make the point that if you look back at least at my lifetime, the two greatest advances in science have been the advances in biology that now let us understand how genes work, whether it's a gene in a human being or a corn plant, and the advances in data science that have let us use the, the computational capabilities you know, to improve and simplify our lives and give us better tools. And both of these tools are changing farming literally around the world. So let's go back to that tractor. And this is what you know, the tractor cab actually looks like today in a modern tractor or a combine. First thing I would tell you is that tractor has more computer power in it than the first spaceships that went to the moon. 
So very sophisticated capability. That farmer has three or four monitors. But before I talk about that, that tractor literally is self-driving. You've all heard of self-driving cars. Farmers already have self-driving tractors. The, the GPS in that tractor will allow it to precisely move up and down the field within a, a half an inch of accuracy. And uh, again, uh, the auto steer basically will take over and drive the most efficient path. But all those monitors and sensors let the farmers make better decisions on when to plant, how many seeds to plant, and how to vary the, uh, the nutrition and, uh, and uh, optimize the uh, harvest. So it, uh, it's a very, very different uh, world on the, uh, the farm. And it goes beyond that. Uh, an explosion, literally, you know, in the digital ag technologies being applied to agriculture, whether it's the satellites or the drones that are available, these, with their imagery capabilities, can literally monitor every single plant in a farmer's field and provide instantaneous input. You know, literally the alert going to the farmer saying, you have a problem on this portion of your field. Maybe that problem is an irrigation valve that's stuck so that that part of the field isn't getting enough water. Or maybe it's a developing insect or disease infestation. And the important point of having that kind of an earlier alert is the farmer can immediately respond and use less you know, chemicals if necessary to treat it, but also by treating early, they enhance and preserve yield. Uh, all kinds of technology. I was out in Silicon Valley a few months ago talking to a, to a group of, of 400 startup companies that were developing new sensors, like the one shown on the left here, which can detect moisture and nitrogen levels uh, in, the, uh, in the field, or the, uh, the equipment that lets us literally map a field so that farmers precisely know how to plant the seeds differently and how to fertilize each part of that field to optimize yield. So really an explosion of data science tools that are, that are changing farming around the world. And I literally mean around the world because it may be that a small farmer in Africa or Asia doesn't have a big computer and a big tractor, but they have a cell phone that's giving them now digital information and weather information and tools to help them make better agronomic uh, decisions. Now, you know, a lot of the advances in the biology side have been better seeds, and I've talked about some of the, the, the GMO and other technology. There's a whole new world emerging now using these advanced biology tools to understand the thousands of microbes that are in the soil. And that information is leading to a new round of uh, breakthroughs. You know, in the, in the world of human medicine, we talk about the human microbiome. You know, think about it this way. If you think about your body and all the blood cells and skin cells and brain cells, imagine that you have 10 times more bacteria living on you or in you. And that's kind of a scary thought, but it also, you know, has opened the door to science to understand how those microbes can help or hurt us. Well, the point is, the same thing happens to that crop in the field. The minute that seedling is growing, microbes are growing on the roots and on the stem. Many of them help the plant by literally serving as small factories to provide micronutrients. Now, with the science we have to be able to sequence the microbial genomes and literally analyze each field, we can discover unique microbes, kind of like probiotics for plants, which can enhance the growth of the plants. And so that's a, an exciting area for science. And then uh, just, you know, I've talked a lot about the biology, the data science. A lot of this comes together from an engineering perspective. And I'll just show you here a quick video clip on what we call our seed chipper, and I'll explain how it, uh, how it works. So these are corn seeds that come in from our breeders around the world. The machine picks up each kernel, orients it in front of uh, a camera, so that the seed is positioned so that we can position it in front of a cutter blade that will take just a, a small, unique sample from, uh, from each of the seeds. So you can see the, uh, the blade in action, cutting the seed. That's what the seed looks like. That small piece of seed is enough to do a DNA test so that now we can understand 
every gene inside of every seed. And that explodes the possibility for enhancing crop breeding. But the point is, this is robotic science. It's engineering. It's complex you know, computational and mathematical skills to, to become part of a, of a modern science and breeding program. And I think it's super uh, exciting. So let me put it all in perspective and close. There's huge challenges, and several of the, the, the comments made earlier were key. There's 7.3 billion people on the planet today. That number is expected to touch 10 billion by 2050. You know, I've done the math a lot of times. I'm 35 years old now. That's 30, you know, you know it's a long time away. By the time I'm 97, I'm not sure how this is going to work out for me, but what I'm counting on is you guys, because... And, you know, I'm counting on my, my three kids as well. But uh, we, uh, we need to do a lot more to meet that challenge. To, to think about feeding 10 billion people, we need to think about producing 100% more chickens, you know, 50 or 60% more pigs. We need to think about how we double the food supply between now and 2050. When you think about what that means, that means between now and 2050, on this planet, we have to produce more food than has been produced in the entire history of the world. That's the challenge that I want to excite you with, and that's a really a critical one. And we're going to have to do it just to make it a little bit more challenging. We're going to have to do it using less water because agriculture today already uses 75% of the fresh water. So we need to have better and more efficient farming practices. And we're going to want to do it using less land. You know, the easy thing to do would be to feed more people just by tearing down more forests and draining more wetlands. If we're smart, we can farm the land we have even better and probably take some of that land and put it back into uh, to other applications, you know, reforest and, and recreate wetlands. Um, and of course, climate change is, is lurking and it's going to particularly hit some of the Asian and African countries. So for me, this is a huge technical challenge. I really think it's a noble challenge for the future. Now, you know, hopefully none of you have experienced hunger. Um, if you have, uh, you, know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's, there's always a thinking that this is somewhere else and it's not really happening. You know, I'll just give you two recent events. Y you know what's going on in the world in terms of migration of, of people. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who believe that, you know, the, the, the start of Arab Spring was because of crop failures across Egypt and Syria, which created bread lines, which created political unrest. Uh, today, uh, you know, there's parts of Somalia and Sudan where, you know, we're under starvation alert. So food security is real from a hunger perspective. It's also real and important from a, a nutritional uh, and food security perspective. But as I said, the other side is everything we invest for food security is a double win because it's also an investment for improving the environment. If we can continue to farm smarter and better, if farmers can continue to improve their productivity as that whole ag food chain enhances, that will be a, that will be an incredible legacy. And for me, that's what excites me. That's why I come to work every day. I can't think of anything more important than inventing technology that both helps provide food security but also helps enhance the, uh, the environment. So what it gets down to now, I think, this is the ask. It gets down to you. Because we know it's going to take a next generation you know, to push the, uh, the science and to push the food and value chain to where it needs to be. Uh, and it's going to need a lot of help. You know, a couple of statistics for you to think about. Over the last 15 years, if you look at the average age of scientists, that age group that's 55 and above has nearly doubled. That means the population is aging, uh, you know, for the scientists. If you take a look at the actual job requirements, it's been estimated by USDA and by Purdue University that we'll need at least 60,000 folks involved with STEM background in the ag and food chain each year for the future. And, and the sad thing is a lot of those aren't going to be filled because, you know, Students, people looking for careers just don't understand, you know, the exciting opportunities in, uh, in bringing uh, STEM background into the, uh, the food chain. And that's, uh, that's what I want to, you know, you know, leave you with is that 
You know, we need engineers, we need data scientists, we need computer programmers. You can run the farm from the computer. If you want to be in farming like, uh, like I started, that's not a prerequisite. But there's just an amazing uh, number of career opportunities. And then down the food chain, food processing, nutrition, uh, just an incredible set of, uh, of opportunities. So I ask you to think about... Uh, about uh, you know the the challenge, uh, the excitement, and and the uh, the importance of uh, of of this. You know, I uh, I had a good friend of mine who uh, owns a company. Uh, he was a, a Google executive who helped start a company in San Francisco. His name's Dave Freeberg, and uh, we acquired his company, the Climate Corporation, a few years ago, right in the heart of San Francisco, right off Market Street. And uh, we were worried about how would it be to recruit data scientists into the ag space when Google or Amazon we're right across the, uh, the street. And Dave said, I haven't had any trouble at all. Here's my speech. Look, you're a brilliant programmer, or you're a wonderful uh, statistician and mathematician. You can go anywhere you want to. It's up to you. You can go create the next version of Angry Bird, or you can help save and feed the world. Your choice. So uh, a real opportunity. Now, I've talked a lot about the science part. I just want to talk for a couple minutes how important a lot of the soft sciences and the com communication is. There's roles for people in HR, in science communication, in outreach, and in public affairs. Because one of the things I've learned, and I think we see it all the time in science, I don't know if any of you were involved with the, the March for Science or some of the recent events, but science is often misunderstood. It isn't just a concern over a GMO or what about vaccination or why are we spending uh, $30 billion a year as a society on drugs that don't work? Um, there's a lot of science education that we need to be involved with. And so maybe some of you are going to grow up and be the next Bill Nye. Or, you know, the program we have here at, uh, at GW, Planet Forward, you know, is a great communication, outreach, and motivation program to bring uh, new talent into, uh, into uh, STEM across the, uh, the ag and, uh, and food chain. So I just ask you to uh, participate. Uh, consider the uh, career opportunities. There's uh, an enormous number of, uh, of resources. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Thrive Program, the, the Feed and Nourish Thrive organization, uh, just launched their website. It's, uh, it's interactive. It's, uh, it's a great portal to, uh, to, to look about careers and jobs. My own company uh, sponsors the Modern Ag uh, website. Uh, I write and talk a lot about this. You can follow me at Twitter and feel free to contact me there. But I hope you, uh, you take the challenge to kind of watch Walk down the path and look and see what uh, what a career in the ag and uh, and uh, food chain could look like. I can't imagine anything more important than being in a career where you're uh, where you're providing food security and uh, and leaving a legacy uh, to uh, to enhance uh, you know the planet, the environment we live in. Thank you very much. Uh, I think um, thank you, Rob. That was. Uh, Terrific. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so you'll get smarter listening to this guy. Um, we have time for one or two questions. Um, Dr. Frehley has to run uh, to many appointments here in Washington. Um, so if, if there are anybody, please go to the middle so we can capture it on, uh, on uh, the audio feed. Anyone? Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Brian Wright. I'm the, one of the directors of the Master's hey, in Data Science program here at GW. And uh, I have a whole bunch of data science students here. Awesome. Uh, just, uh, just sign me up. I've got business cards. Uh, yeah. I, should, uh, I should have left a couple out there if anybody needs one. We've got them. All I right. Everybody awesome. got one when okay. they in. All good. right. Well, good. Well, that's one of the things I just wanted to, to say that they're here. But if there are opportunities, you know, for uh, – either colleagues that you have in the area that I could reach out to or yourself and bring them into the classroom. I mean, we've got 150 some data science students and we bring people in from healthcare and from geography, but it'd be great to have somebody come in. Yeah, I mean, uh, da data science is changing. It, you know, here's the easy way to think about it. Yeah. Agriculture is the oldest industry on the planet. It's also the least technified. So that means that data science is, and is gonna modernize ag just like it has communications and healthcare. So the opportunities are endless, whether it's in research, uh, whether it's in commercial operations, you know, looking at the, uh, you know, the transportation and movement of food, the processing, just a huge opportunity. Uh, we, uh, I can't tell you how many roles and opportunities exist. Really exciting. Okay. Good, all right, well thanks. Thank you. Cool. All right. Great.
Great. We've got one more here, and right. then uh, I think we're going to send you on your way. Perfect. That, that, whatever is, that, that should be on your front page uh, for recruiting students into your <laughs> program, right? So good evening. My name is Jillian Blair. I'm actually a high school instructor. I teach um, multiple engineering classes as well as environmental science. But I went to school for plant and soil science. So now I teach environmental science with my students. And um, this is my sixth year. I've never had any information about plant and soil science or agriculture ever brought to us. We have things, you know, for engineering mm -hmm. or, or not even agriculture engineering. Um, internships and those kind of things. I do a big soil science unit and my students love it, but I don't necessarily know how to translate that into their interest into attending university for those majors. They say, yeah, I liked it, it was fun, but I'm gonna do something else. And I don't know if there is a big effort to really start with the high schoolers or even younger because I have not seen it. And if there are resources, I would like to know about those resources so that I can use those with my Great. students well, also. Uh, certainly, um, there's many companies that are providing those resources, and, including our own. And you know, we certainly uh, you know, recognize the importance of connecting students to science even earlier than uh, the high school years. You know, that earlier contact is key. But you know, um, uh, the ability to support you with, uh, with training packs and, uh, and lab kits, uh, you know, the ability to do site visits and tours, and uh, even uh, you know to be able to arrange uh, special types of uh, summer programs and uh, traineeships are, are all out there. So if you uh, if you again email me, I'll uh, I'll put my uh, connections uh, together for you. But I'm sure many of the other uh, folks here in the STEM Connector will uh, follow up on your request, and you'll be inundated with opportunities because oh, you know, there's a on. lot of resources <laughs> out there. And importantly, I hope you get the sense from me. There's a huge need in the future, and we're talking about you know, jobs, high paying tech and STEM jobs. So it's a, it's a great career opportunity for a young student. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Appreciate All right, it. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good. Thank yeah, you. We'll see you later. All right. Yeah, we'll be back. Good time on the Hill. Yep.